it's, I've never been in a meeting like this before, and, and it, it's giving me a lot, it, I, hope, I hope for you, it, like me, it's giving you lots of really warm and just really delightful feelings to be, a, to be in a group of people that really appreciate Apis mellifera for what it is, not to make honey, not, not to do you know, any pollination, just, I mean, those are wonderful things, but the bee in itself, just by its own right, just its own lives, is a fascinating thing, and, and, uh, as I think that we all know. You know, biologists have a phenomenon, that, there's a pheno behavioral phenomenon called imprinting. It's where a young, or, young animal sees something of interest that is important to it, and it imprints on that, and it tracks that, that thing, or it will follow that thing, be attracted to that thing for the rest of its life, a baby duckling, for example tracking its mother. Well, when I was 10 years old, I imprinted on a bee tree. <laughs> and that, that probably sounds a little weird, but here's what happened. I was walking up the road near my parents' house outside of Ithaca, New York, and a swarm of bees was going, I saw a swarm of bees settling and going in a knot hole in a big black walnut tree. And I was just utter, I was scared by it, so I went on the other side of the road and I watched from there and I could see that they were, they were indeed moving into this. I had heard the buzzing and seen them going in. And that summer, um, little by little, I learned that I could get close to that knot hole. I could get a step ladder, get myself up there, and just watch those bees going in and out. And um, that was my start with the bees, and I, I, I feel just so lucky that, that that was my introduction. I went on to become a beekeeper, and I, I, I'm proud to be a, a decent beekeeper, but I, I think, like you, I, I'm even more interested in how the bees live on their own and understanding their biology. Um, what I want to do now is, uh, to help introduce this meeting, is just address this question. How do these bees live in our hearts? Not just our brains, which is what I was referring to there, but really deep inside us. Why do we like them so much? Why are we so intrigued by them? I think there are several reasons. Several dimensions of this. One is appreciation. They are our most important pollinator insect. They make honey. So they do valuable things for us, and for that we appreciate them. We also have admiration for them. Their social system is, is just, well, it's, it's a paradigm of, of cooperation and the evolution of, of functional organization above the level of the individual, at the society level, to really form a, a, a functional unit out of a group, of what we would call a superorganism. And I also think a third dimension is, of course, fascination. They are utterly fascinating. They are, um, or you could say they're mysterious, and, and thus they fascinate us. So I want to say a few words about, about those three, mostly the fascination one. The appreciation. Yeah, that's been with us for a long, long, long time. Um, it goes back, I think, to even before prehistory. If you, if you look at gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans, they all like honey too. I think our pre-human ancestors liked honey. So they've been on our radar as a wonderful, uh, intriguing source of sweetness for a long time. And we all know these cave paintings over in Cave in Spain, those are wonderful. Um, the earliest known hive beekeeping, Egyptian temple, 4,500 years ago. But that stuff is, that's new stuff, that's new. I think people, even but I think honeybees came to people, came into our pots and all that way back at the, at the beginning of uh, evolution of farming. So I think our direct love goes back many months, is older than this, and goes back, as I say, to pr probably to our origins or even before, 300,000 years ago. So appreciation, spittle, honey is a special food. Admiration. Here I won't even try to say it because uh, Charles Butler in the Feminine Monarchy said it so eloquently when he wrote, the work and fruit of the little bee is so great and wonderful, so comely for order and beauty, so excellent for art and wisdom, and so full of pleasure and profit that the contemplation thereof may well be seen an ingenious nature. Now that is admiration. <laughs> 
and then we come to a little bit of fascination. And this is, this is what I, I know best, so I'll say the most about it. Um, just two examples of our fascination. That's a fossil bee, that's 300, that's a 30 million year old fossil bee, gene, uh, species Apis henshaw. It's not, its home is not far from here. It was found in a clay shale in, uh, outside of Frankfurt back in the 1850s. And uh, so that, to me, is fascinating, that we are so fascinated by this insect that we really want to go find its ancient, most ancient possible ancestors uh, yes. through fossil hunting. And here on the other extreme, here's a, a thermogram made in the 1990s of heater bees in the brood nest. And it, you know, we're using our sophisticated tools to better understand what's going on um, uh, inside a hive to delight our fascination. Now, that, all of those things, that admiration, the fascination, the appreciation, those are all things that relate to us. They're our interests. But the, what we do with those interests and learn from the bees, I think, think, is that they give us a special power to connect us with nature. I bet you, most of you folks, look at bees as a is probably the piece of nature you may look at the most closely. It's the part of, it's the piece of nature whose biology you know best. And because you've been watching it so closely, it, these bees, I think, really give us a kind of, they serve for us a kind of like heartbeat with our planet's natural cycles. I mean, everybody here is a beekeeper, a, a, a bee haver, bee tree observer, whatever, but you know that it changes with the seasons. If you look, open up a hive, you'll see this lovely scene of brood rearing in early spring. As the bees renew their activities, the brood rearing. A little bit later in the spring, you look around, you see swarms, swarming. A little bit later, in the fall, in the autumn, <coughs> where we are, where I live, we have the goldenrod and the purple aster. <coughs> It's just a wonderful time of the year. So the bees are loading up on gold and pollen, and as well as the nectar. You can see that bee's got some of both. Her honey stomach is, is nearly full, and she's got some pollen on her legs. And then, come winter, yeah, it's the quietness of an apiary. You realize, but <laughs> it looks quiet, but we all know that inside there, there is a cluster of bees keeping warm, alive. And, they are, and the honeybee is the only insect on the planet that gets through cold periods by keeping itself warm as a homeopathy. But that is the quiet time of the year. But there's another way that I think that the bees give us, have a special connection to nature. And that is they, they can give us feedback. They can actually tell us how well we're doing in keeping the world, taking care of the world. It's a long-lived, wild colony of bees. And those bees, where they live, I know that the, the, they're thriving there. They've been there many years. And so I know that they're able to get clean food, clean water. Um, and so that, that patch of the planet that they live on is, is well cared for. You might say it's, it's not cared for at all. It's out in the middle of a forest, <laughs> and nobody's doing anything with that forest. So in that sense, by leaving that forest alone, we're taking care of that piece of nature. Another sign of that for me is if I put up a bait hive and I get a swarm that moves into it. Um, and again, this is in an area where there aren't many bee, there's not, there aren't many apiaries. I know that whatever, that part of the world is supporting the, the bees, keeping them alive. Strong enough colonies are healthy enough to cast swarms. The third thing, and this is the one that any of you who that um, are scientists or biologists, whatever, this is the one where you real you realize that this this insect is at a very amazing. Well, it's a it is the insect that we know the most about. Somebody here that might study fruit flies might, might beg to differ, but <laughs> <laughs> broadly speaking, from physiology, sensory biology, etc., genetics and behavior, Apis mellifera is it. 
It's an at least it's a very important source of information about how the natural world works. And some of the examples or avenues within that investigation are, for example, animal communication, the famous discovery of the waggle dance, really stretched out our appreciation of the sophistication, the range of competence of, of communication systems of animals. Animal orientation. This little bee flying back and forth from its hive or bee tree out to, out to its food sources, that is an amazing feat of navigation. The, great, the longest distance I know that bees will travel to collect food was recorded here in England at the University of, uh, uh, I bet it names. Sussex? No, not Sussex, farther north, Sheffield, Sheffield. Yes, that's right, yeah, <laughs> that was what I needed. Um, the bees were flying from a laboratory at the University of Sussex in the city out to the moors, and the, based on reading their dances, it was determined that the maximum distance they were going was 14 kilometers. So in miles speak, that's 8.4 miles. So, um, 8.2 miles. So uh, that's, uh, that's appreciable. And to imagine, you know, that is million, that's thousands, tens of thousands of bees' body lengths. And so that would be for us like well, I won't even go through, try to do the mental math on that. That's a, that's a, that's, that would be several hundred miles by, on our scale. And the bee's ability to do that has been very revealing about how a little brain can, uh, can, can accomplish those sorts of tasks. And then, of course, one of my favorites is the bees have been very revealing to us about how to build a collective intelligence where the group working together can solve um, cognitive information problems better than any one member of the group can, such as in the house on the nest side choice. And there's a fourth feature of bees for, for connecting us with nature, and that is that we get hooked on these bees. We get really curious about what these bees are doing. Like, and here I'm going to have to ask you to sort of go back in time to when you first got connected to bees when you were just seeing all these mysterious things the bees were doing. How many people here can remember the first time they saw a bee carrying a load of propolis and wondering, what's that shiny stuff on that bee's leg? I remember. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Here's another one. Wax scales on the, on the underside of the abdomen. I think the first time, how many people remember the first time they saw that and puzzled about that, wondered about that? Ooh, what's wrong with that bee? <laughs> what's that growth? <laughs> what are those curious little white things? <laughs> and here's a bee collecting in wa collecting water in January up in Scotland when it was it was I don't know do you guys use Fahrenheit or centigrade? It was centigrade. It was it was just above four degrees C. It was four point one degrees C. And so what was that bee doing? Well, in fact, it, what, what it was is the colony was rearing brood. It wasn't. It needed water to dilute its its nectar, but it wasn't co um, wasn't bringing in uh, water via nectar. So the little bees went out there, and using those thermographic cameras, you can see that that bee, while she is there drinking that water, it takes her about a minute to load up. She's she's running that her, she's running her flight muscles to keep her thorax warm enough so she can fly home. There's another question. Why, why do the nectar foragers, the bee on the uh, left there, when they come in the hive, why do they have to pass off their, why do they pass off their nectar to the unloader bees? Why don't they do just like the pollen foragers, walk over to the combs and pollen foragers, you know, kick it off into the cells themselves? Why does this bee do that, pass off the nectar? Well, it's in, we've learned that it, nectar processing is more complicated than pollen processing. And it makes sense to have a division of labor. Dumping it to a nectar receiver enables the forager to zoom back to the field quickly. And how do bees, here's a mystery that we don't know the answer to. How do the bees decide when to switch from making drone comb, the smaller cells, to the, uh, for the worker cells, the worker comb, switch over to making the drone comb, the larger cells, when they build their nests? I'd love to know the answer. Anybody's got any good ideas about that? <laughs> Let me know. 
Oh, here's, here's I think this is my last one. Here's a little, here's a drone coming out, and you can see he's got his tongue out to that walk, worker bee, even before he's out of the cell. <laughs> now, we know drones are hungry guys, <laughs> but this really shows us just how, how hungry they can be, and how much this bee is this drone, whose purpose in life is very simple and, and direct, um, but it's very, he needs fuel, and he's, he's getting, right from the get-go, he's, he's making sure he's getting tanked up and ready to go. So, how do these bees live in our hearts? I feel it's appreciation, admiration, fascination. And I also think and that they are, and I believe probably you would agree with me, they really are special ambassadors from the natural world to give us to connect us with the planet. They inspire us to enjoy and protect them, and they are beacons of the, of the environmental conditions. So I hope that helps set the stage, set the scene for this meeting. Um, I, I know this is going to be a, a very special meeting. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.